Chapter One of A Soldier's Letters to Charming Nelly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Early Experiences in Camp Winter Quarters of Fourth Texas near Dumfries, Virginia, January 3, 1862 your cordial and flattering acknowledgment of our introduction at long range is both gratifying and encouraging it is not only evidence of the deep interest the ladies of the south take in our glorious cause but it also proves that the humblest confederate soldier is not friendless and thus furnishes him with an additional incentives to meet the inevitable trials and dangers of war with uncomplaining fortitude and courage while not vain enough to appropriate the compliment of your letters entirely to myself I shall try to deserve them as well, because the correspondence will be a great pleasure to me. As for the reason that by showing myself worthy I may, I trust, count on having a friend at court. In that capacity you may prove yourself of immense service, and earn my warmest gratitude. While it may be true that absence makes the heart grow fonder, I fear the statement applies only to the absent organ, not to the deserted. All things considered, our winter quarters are quite comfortable. They may lack symmetrical proportions, furniture, and now and then doors and roofs, but we expended so much muscular energy upon them, and have taxed our combined architectural ability so enormously that we're both proud of them and glad to be relieved from further strain of mind. The responsibility for the cabin which shelters my mess was impartially and judiciously distributed among its members. To the veteran, Mr. William Morris, whose service in the Mexican War entitles him to that distinction, was entrusted the planning and general supervision. To Floyd, Sneed, and Dansby, the cutting and hauling of the timbers and the riving of the clapboards for the roof. And to Brahan, and your humble servant, the digging of a level foundation on the side of the hill. Then, when the frame was built, the picket set in place and the roof finished, there was a reapportionment. The veteran volunteered to build the stick chimney, and I to make and carry the mud. Sneed and Floyd took charge of the interior furnishing and decorating, and Brahan and Dansby dawed with the cracks. The product of our joint labors is a most elegant structure, but unfortunately for the veteran and Dansby, the former made such a miscalculation of the space required for six men that, to punish him for his carelessness, he and Dansby have, by unanimous vote, of the four for whom there is room, been condemned to sleep in a tent. It is hard on Dansby, I admit, but he has no business to have a bedfellow support figures. The weather has been terribly cold and rainy for the last three weeks. I have suffered from it, perhaps more than anybody else in the company. For to please Brahan's fastidious tastes as to soldierly appearance, and to keep even with him, I weakly yielded before we left Richmond to his suggestion that we buy caps, and then foolishly gave the splendid hat I brought from Texas to a darky. The top of the cap tilts to the front at an angle of 45 degrees, and thus carries water over the visor just big enough to catch hold of with the thumb and forefinger, down on the point of my nose. And the back of it follows the slope of the occiput, and conveys every drop of rain and flake of snow that falls down my spinal column. Brahan, orderly sergeant, I, a humble private, he stays in camp while I stand guard do fatigue duty and otherwise expose myself. And thus, you see, although I have kept even with him so far as presenting a soldierly appearance goes, he does not near keep even with me in the way of discomfort. If there is anything else I have a right to complain of in common with every member of the brigade is the vagaries and hallucinations of the brilliantly astute politician now in command of the brigade. They have been so frequent as to become monotonous. Old Sam Houston must have known 
whereof he spake when he dubbed him Wiggletail. Whether it be due to constitutional nervousness or that produced by the applejack and kindred liquid refreshments of which he is said to be so fond, he has kept us for the last month and particularly since Christmas holidays began in a state of almost constant apprehension. He sees a Yankee in every shadow. Here's one approaching in every breeze that rustles and clinks together the ice-encrusted boughs of the pine trees, under which the cabin selected for the brigade headquarters stands, and no sooner sees or hears one than he takes alarm and orders the long roll sounded by the drummer he keeps close at hand for just such emergencies. The roll, I must inform you, is not the spasmodic rat-a-tat you are accustomed to hear when a company of home guards are drilling in the vicinity of your prairie home, but it is a continuous, ear-splitting tat-tat-tat. It is only ordered when danger is too imminent to permit of a moment's delay, and its effect on sleeping soldiers is always startling, and often ludicrous in the extreme. It means that every man must get to the color line without even an instant's delay, fully prepared to resist an attack. The first time I heard it, it awoke me from the profoundest slumber of my life so suddenly, and scared me so badly that for two minutes I looked under my bed for my gun and out of doors for my pantaloons. As the first Texas has its winter quarters within a quarter mile of the doughty general and his drummer, it has been more frequently robbed of sleep and inspired to profanity than any other regiment in the brigade. Since the first two or three flurries, colonels Archer and Hood have wisely waited for verbal orders before arousing their commands. Previous to that, Colonel Archer once led the 5th Texas halfway to Cockpit Point before he learned he was on a wild goose chase. Thank the Lord, say I, and I know the whole brigade joins me in that Thanksgiving. It is pretty well settled that Wigfall will not long remain in command of us. We're willing to fight the Yankees, but, but not phantoms. That was Hamlet's task, you know, as my recollection is that he succeeded ill at the business. Barring guard and fatigue duty and deprivation of female society, our time passes very pleasantly visiting friends in other companies and regiments and playing checkers, chess, and cards. Whist and Euchre are the games most indulged in, but poker has many devotees and is the favorite with a couple of messes in our company which occupy cabins on the opposite sides of the company street and at the lower end of it. Each gives a peculiar but well-recognized notice of its readiness for a game. When the supper dishes are washed and put away, Dick S. steps outside and cries in his deep bass voice, Charcoal! 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 in exact imitation of the vendors of that commodity in the large cities. Following him, or perhaps preceding him, the musical tenor of Walter B. is heard singing the first stanza of an old song known as Old Mother Flanagan. And ten minutes after, either call, the dining table of the mess from which it proceeds is surrounded by as many players as can find room to sit and the cash to venture. No great amount of money is ever won or lost, for our amateur gamblers have not yet acquired the nerve of professionals and never go beyond St. Annie. The dailies of Richmond reach us every evening, and from them we learn much that otherwise would remain concealed from us. The great cry and hope is for recognition of the Southern Confederacy by France and England. Every item argument and expression on that subject is listened to with an avidity that gives the lie to the loud mouth declarations of our fire-eaters that they are thirsting for Yankee gore, and would be ashamed to go home without the smell of the powder of battle. It may convict me of cowardice, but nevertheless, I frankly confess that I would be glad to get home without a single taste or memento of conflict. I am strictly bucolic in temperament, you see, not in the least warlike. Satisfied that the chance of war is equal and the slayer oft is slain, 
and warned by that truth i have no desire to experience the stern joy which warriors feel in foemen worthy of their steel still i propose to take chances with my comrades and if there be fighting do my duty to my country as conscientiously as my legs will permit it is really amusing to note the eagerness of some men to hear news one old fellow of company f has a habit of listening open-mouthed to what's being told and then placing his hand over his left ear and saying please tell that over again will ya and the boys find great fun in manufacturing sensational news and playing upon his curiosity and credulity the professor of latin for company f calls him quidnook but whether as a term of reproach or compliment is beyond my ken you were so kind to wish we had a merry merry christmas every mess had its eggnog or a first-class substitute for it the first thing in the morning and something better than common for dinner while after supper the veteran says the whole company became tangle-footed <laughs> but he must be mistaken the fellow that is the drunkest always claims to be the soberest man in the party anyhow he and i were at captain cunningham's quarters until midnight and when we left them i found no difficulty in reaching my own the veteran attributes the circumstance wholly to the fact that i went downhill but i scorned the base imputation <laughs> the next day headaches were both epidemic and contagious and i admit i had caught one you must pardon the dullness and egotism of this letter only the most trivial incidents occur in these days of waiting and watching and had you acquaintances in the regiment i, I might entertain you by relating some of their ups and downs deprived of that foundation for gossip one has to be more egotistic than is in good taste sentiment would be dangerous i fear in this stage of our acquaintance even were it not interdicted by loyalty to our mutual friend if the war continues which i hope and pray it may not i will likely find many incidents to relate that will be entertaining to as ardent a rebel as yourself end of chapter one a recording by dale latham